The film that you are going to see was made in cooperation between Zagreb Films of Yugoslavia and the National Film Board of Canada. And that combination in itself is quite remarkable because it seems that regardless of ideology, there is now a growing and common concern with the global problems of pollution.
one has the sense now that technology is almost autonomous. That the moment we have an idea, the means constantly subvert the ends. Means constantly subvert human ends. And so we are caught up in, in, a, in, a, in a technological self-fulfilling system, which is very frightening because human control is being subverted. This is not to imply that we, we must have a renunciation of technology. It is to imply that technology and science must be brought under human control or we are going to be destroyed by it. Of all Earth's creatures, man is indeed the most adaptable. He's built shelters, discovered communication. Gee, I'm sorry, Frank. I'm uh, <clears throat> busy tonight. Alleviated boredom. <laughs> Assuage needs. Solve problems. No one's buying it, Chief. Hire an ad agency. Created beauty. Understood tragedy. Oh, my bicycle has a flat tire. Okay, okay, I'll buy a new one. Withstood holocausts. And so on. And there's no reason why man can't adapt to the pollution problem. When the air gets too foul to breathe, man's lungs will enlarge in order to hold more oxygen. And naturally, in order to support his enormous body, his legs will enlarge. And his neck would stretch so that he could get to cleaner air. His arms would grow also. In order to keep his balance, he'd develop a tail. Because of his size, placental reproduction would be awkward. So he'd have to lay eggs. And I'm also contributing to tomorrow's oil pools. There are at least two myths, I think, about pollution that are perpetuated. Uh, cabinet ministers and presidents of oil companies always say that we've always had pollution which is sort of a sop to make people feel, well, since we've always had pollution, then obviously we don't have to worry about it, you know, we'll cope with it. But the point is that pollution today is totally unique and unprecedented. You know, there's a million chemicals in our environment that weren't there before 1945, and for which we have no previous assessment. We don't know what the total environmental impact is. And the other one, the other myth that I hear bruited about is that we are adaptable and therefore we will adapt to radiation, we'll adapt to pollution and so on. And of course, this is nonsense because uh, evolutionary adaptation, first of all, takes centuries and centuries. We ourselves are the result of millions of years of adaptation. So we are not going to adapt in that way. The way we will adapt, I'm quite sure, is culturally, which is horrifying. We'll, you know, go to work in gas masks, we will work all day in gas masks. We will walk on the street and shop in special masks, which gives us oxygen. We will live in huge, sterile domes like bees. This is the way we may well adapt.
You know, it's a general characteristic of technocratic solutions to indulge in some sort of technical fantasy, which may be feasible, but which operates in such a so social and cultural and political vacuum that it's not realizable. And, you know, one can imagine all sorts of things. One can imagine getting rid of, of, of waste and garbage through time machines. <laughs> also has to get rid of its garbage. Thank you. 
parlance of the sociology of science. We call it the technological fix. And in every case, the unprecedented side effects that occur when you introduce a new technology which is supposed to cure a defect is often more serious in its, in its effects than the original technology. I found this film had an interesting a perception of attitudes towards pollution because our, our normal attitude is that as long as we can't see it, as long as we dispose of it and can't see it, then it's no longer our problem. And in the same way, uh, uh, I think part of our value system does not allow us to place any value on the future, uh, not even the near future. And therefore, uh, we do everything as though we are consumed by the present. And we assume, on the other hand, that the future somehow will take care of it. So we defer pollution costs to the future. Most of our response to pollution problems have been one whereby we discern a symptom and we proceed to chase that symptom to death. And we're successful. We get rid of phosphates. We may even get rid of some noise around airports and so on. And what we never quite do, which has to be done, we never quite say, what is the disease of which these are the symptoms? The mere passing of legislation doesn't mean that the legislation will be enforced. As a matter of fact, the pattern is that, that the passing of legislation tends to be tokenistic. And in the, the confrontation between our economic imperatives and our ecological imperatives, I'm afraid ecology usually loses. So uh, this idea that, that, that the law is the instrument is perhaps wrong. The other idea is that uh, when we rely on, on Big Brother, this is the big brother of uh, anti-noise pollution. To do this for us, of course, it, it, there's a danger, there's an inherent danger of all technology and of all technical solutions. That is, technology has a tendency to indulge in overkill and a tendency to lose any discrimination. We, we could see that in the, in the mass bombings in, in Vietnam, in the destruction of land. We can see it in the use of pesticides. We feel that if we if we use a hundred times what is necessary to kill our enemies, whether they're pests or humans, 
then by some mysterious fashion, it's going to be that more efficient and complete. What we forget is that, that humans have psychological resistance and pests have biological resistance. And so overkill leads to its own backlashes. So there's this, this dangerous aspect, as we saw in the film, of, of, of relying, first of all, on, on a single powerful central authority to solve these problems. These problems are going to be solved by people by people understanding and participating and involving themselves. If we come to a t point in time where the solutions are imposed on us, really we will be in the age of 1984. In the beginning, there were vast, far-reaching expanses of land, water, and air. There was lots of space for man to live in and enjoy. discovered he was crowded. Of course, it's all man's fault. He's simply too big. So all we really need to do is shrink people to a hundredth of their size. And there'll be plenty of space again. The world would be new once more, offering new vistas to man, to his inquisitive drive, his adventurous spirit. Fantastic as it may seem, this dream has actually become reality. What you are looking at is the first ounce of that potent elixir which will give man a new future. I think Canada has an enormous population problem, but from a different point of view. And that is from the point of view of depleting the world's resources. If we consider that the world's resources are finite, you know, the iron and the steel and the copper, the aluminum and the paper and the protein, and if we took all the world's production and we divided it evenly among every one of the 3.6 billion people, everybody would be underdeveloped. And this is the terrible problem, that we have a maldistribution of consumption of the critical resources that in turn reflect a maldistribution of justice, a maldistribution of health, a maldistribution of wealth. And a country like Canada has a far greater responsibility. It's far more incumbent on Canada to practice population control because a Canadian in their lifetime will consume about 30 times as much of all these critical materials than a third worlder in their lifetime. Therefore, our population, in terms of resource consumption, is something like 600 million. Our population is almost like the population of China in terms of what we, what we consume, and the American population, in terms of what they consume, is, is larger than the whole population of the world. And the other side of that is we are also sort of pollution imperialists. 
because the burden of pollution that we add into the total gross pollution of the planet is far greater than our population. Potentially, it's possible. Uh, maybe not in exactly that way, but potentially the, the invasion of privacy and the altering of perception through electronic means is quite a real threat. It's not an abstract threat. And, and the other aspect of, of the film that I think is, is quite frightening is, is a myth, the perpetuating of a kind of philosophical myth that what you don't see can't hurt you. And of course, we know that isn't so with pollution. Nevertheless, this is the way people react to it. People only react according to what they truly perceive. And when they see uh, visible evidence of pollution, when the air is thick and smelly and you can't avoid it, that they call pollution, or where the water is filthy, the water that they use or is on their property, that, of course, is pollution. But the fact is that the real large-scale threats are not discernible. We cannot perceive them. They're taking place at a global level. They're taking place in the huge, subtle climate changes, in the interferences in the great natural cyclical balances of elements that are necessary to sustain life. They're taking place slowly in the oceans. Now, we don't know. We don't have proof. We can't say when doomsday is going to be. No scientist with credibility can give you the date. But we know the threat is there. We know we're on a collision course with some kind of catastrophe, unless we do something about it. Thank <laughs> you. 
this is a kind of symbolic vision of, of what the world is moving to, uh, moving into a world in which uh, all our emotional kicks are surrogate. They're all synthetic. Uh, and none of them involve people. And the world and our cities become the penny arcade, where we go and we drop our monies in and we get our money's worth in, in terms of any kind or number of different kicks. And of course, we also always look for the boss kick. There's always escalation, which is another characteristic of addiction, that, that uh, eventually uh, the mild kick is not sufficient to satisfy us because we get surfeited with it. So we have to raise the intensity, and we need a more profound kick. And so we're always searching for, for that ultimate kick. And it's also it, it's kind of part of the American dream the American dream of sort of finding the ultimate experience, the, the ultimate marriage, the ultimately beautiful girl who is sort of plastically beautiful. And um, finding it within this scheme of plenty, finding it within this scheme of things, of, of devices, of everything except where it must be found for salvation in oneself and between ourselves. Man is the most aggressive creature on Earth. However, there may be ways to harness this energy for useful purposes. sort of am opposed to the, to the whole thrust of this, that we must assume that we are naturally hostile, and that we're naturally aggressive, and that the only hope, therefore, is to take that aggression and to use it constructively. One could equally find evidence that, that our behavior is entirely conditioned by our culture, and uh, there would be a, a, as good a case to be made for cultural determinism of behavior than we are naturally, fundamentally genetically programmed to be aggressive. So, And I'm inclined to agree with the cultural determinists, not because one side is superior scientifically than the other, but it seems to me it's a devil of a problem to recycle aggression, as they've shown in the film. But that if we, if we assume that, that our behavior is largely determined culturally, then we, we have a, a, a task that's of human dimension.
film is about the area of, of, of the stress of a synthetic technological environment which gradually numbs and destroys our capacities to feel and think and sense humanly and to relate humanly and we end up uh, going insane and I'm sure that uh, that this kind of stress that uh, a psychic impoverishment has taken a terrible toll already in America and in countries that are going through the Americanization of their culture. This idea that we can undo the psychic pollution by, in effect, mechanically or chemically changing humans so that they attain sainthood or become angels is simply not tenable. We can't achieve a state of grace by mechanical or chemical means. Nor do I believe that we can suddenly become good, that we can abstract ourselves from real objective circumstances and reverse all our roles suddenly. Uh-oh. I'm not taking the car today, dear. Looks like an inversion out there. I don't want to make matters worse. I don't blame you. Well, got a rush. Mmm. Mm. 
You sure smell good. Oh, boy, you sure can't beat natural smells. Uh, <laughs> oh, does that mean you'll be late for dinner? Yeah, oh, I guess so. i got to make up for the time it'll take getting to work. Okay. I'll keep the beans warm. Bye, honey. Good morning, Mr. Fondue. Here's the new design, all ready for your approval. Ta-ta. Are you guys crazy? Look at this waste of material. We don't need fenders this big. Nobody needs fenders this big. Good Lord, this motor's made for an airplane. Talk about pollution. This thing will do the job of 20 cars. And what's all this fancy stuff hanging all over? You want to kill somebody? What a waste. Don't you guys understand that we're in the transportation business? We just want to help people get from A to B, not cater to childish fantasies. Good God, can you imagine what rush hour would be like if everybody owned one of these monsters? Just a simple, practical, clean, inoffensive vehicle. That's all I'm asking for. Does that sound like an unreasonable request? Go back and design something useful! Say, I, I wonder what's keeping Henry with that report. Henry? What's keeping you, son? What? Oh, too bad. Well, look, make sure you stay there till the ambulance arrives. Sure, we'll wait. No, oh, no, don't, don't worry. We can always order more coffee. <laughs> Only had 12 so far. <laughs> Hello, son. I'm sorry, but our meeting is taking longer than I expected. So we'll have to go swimming another time. Is it Daddy? Is it Daddy? Oh, that's okay, Dad. Gloria and me will take a bike ride or something. Aww. Hey, Gloria. I got a good idea. Let's clean the house. Oh, boy. I want a vacuum. Oh, dear. I just can't get these towels bright enough. So who wants bright towels? If it takes all those chemicals to brighten them, it's not worth it. As long as they're clean, that's the main thing. Oh, of course. How stupid of me. I'm a victim of false needs. Gosh, here I am, preaching about chemicals, and I'm filling my lungs with this stuff. I just love kids. When Derek and I get married, we're going to fill the house with them. Yes, it's a temptation. But we're not having any more. Huh? Mm, the population boom is frightening. We're planning to adopt. Hands up. Uh, please, I've got a wife and four children. OK, drop it. Oi, now what am I going to do? Go to jail, no doubt. <laughs> Oh, hey, now, don't take it so hard. Uh, nothing ever goes right. First, I get all these mouths to feed, then I lose my job. Next, my wife moves out on me. All I want is enough to eat, for Pete's sake. Oh, well, how about coming over to my place for supper? Hey, what kind of work do you do? I know of a few places where they're looking for help. Anyway, you can stay with me and the family. Can I put my hands down now? <laughs> Gosh, did I hurt you? It's, it's nothing. But you're bleeding. Hey, Butch, throw me a towel. This guy's bleeding. It, it, it's nothing, really. What do you have to hit him so hard for? Didn't I tell you it was dangerous if you got carried away? You never said nothing about bleeding. All right. Go get it, tiger. Kill. Yeah! Amen. All right. Next. Excuse me, Sergeant, but does that bag of sand represent the enemy? Yeah. You mean if we ever meet the enemy, who's really another human being, we have to stick this into them? I never thought of it like that, Private. Why, it's, it's barbaric. Sorry to bring it up, Sarge. I thought you should know. I wonder if the lieutenant knows. What? I, 
I, I wouldn't lie to you, sir. This is serious, Lieutenant. We'd better inform the general. What? But I, I thought it was just a game. Oh, wait till I tell the others. What? 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 I believe that neither of these are viable answers, although I do agree that the question is one of values. All over the world, people are developing a growing, quite miraculous consensus that we are dealing with a disease, and that that disease is the blind pursuit of uncontrolled growth, and that if we continue in that blind pursuit, we undoubtedly will destroy ourselves. Wow, there must be 20,000 people here today to witness the event of the century, the congealing of Niagara Falls. In a few minutes, the final drop of water will be rounding the bend for the last 100 yards before it drops to oblivion and into history. And now with the aid of our reporter copter, we're going to try and get a closer look. In the meantime, when you take a look at the crowds down there, they're having the time of their lives. If we can just get the camera in there. There it is. There it is. And she's moving right along. Listen to that crowd. While we're waiting, most of you probably know that one time the earth was covered with quite a bit of water. But thanks to progress and technology, almost all of it has been filled. And of course, we're here today to witness. Ladies and gentlemen, there she is, hovering on the peak of the fall area. And there she goes. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. History is made today as the last drop of water dropped this last drop to join the billions of drops before it, thus making every body of water on earth safe for walking. Phew, I'm thirsty. Thank <laughs> you.